Uh, so I'm talking about cast and Node.js. Um, kind of the agenda, I have two things I want to really cover. It's kind of almost two different presentations in a way. Is uh, an introduction to cast and then kind of things we learned uh, as, we, as we built cast uh, as a project on top of Node.js. So, you know, the background of this is uh, auto scaling is mostly a dirty, dirty lie. Um, it doesn't really exist in the real world. Some people do it, you can auto scale web servers, but overall, most companies that aren't Google or Facebook or, you know, have massive investments in infrastructure don't really have auto scaling solutions. Um, but on the other hand, resources like servers or storage are getting easier and easier to acquire, but the apps themselves are just not ready to auto scale. So what we started looking at uh, was what infrastructure is missing to make this work. And we really felt it focused around deployment and service management. And that is very different than configuration management. There is some overlap, especially the closer you get to service management with configuration management with Chef and Puppet and such. But we felt there's big enough difference there. It's, you know, you can focus just on this deployment and service management part and be very good at that. Um, so at the time, we were all working for a startup uh, called CloudKick. And we're like, well, screw this. Let's just start writing code and do it. And so that's what we did. So uh, CAST, at the very highest level today, is deployment as an HTTP API. You can install uh, applications. You create a tarball. You upload it, and it goes. Uh, you can do things like upgrading it once it's deployed, start, stop, restart. Uh, it has built-in monitoring of applications, so you can tell if your application actually started. Uh, it has built-in access to the log files that those apps create. And then in the long run, we want to do things like full app configuration across the cluster which is kind of a miniature zookeeper. So at a high level, this is what we want CAST to look like in the long run. It's not all the way there right now. Uh, but basically, you have a series of agents that install on your servers, wherever they are. CAST doesn't really care. Uh, and then there's a set of REST APIs that you use to communicate with those agents. And those agents within themselves are kind of self-organizing and talk to each other over peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Um, so basically, your CAST client or a web app or whatever interface you want talks over this REST API to your servers, uh, which is very different compared to the interaction you have with a traditional system like Puppet or Chef, where it's generally you have a central repository of your configuration. And, you know, there's a Puppet master and there's all these Puppet agents that pull down that configuration. Um, it's just for deployment stuff, you want much more control over when things are happening. You know, you, when you do a upgrade of your web app, you want it to all happen on all your web servers at a specific time, or do an incremental rolling out of it, which is just not how most implementations of Puppet and Chef are done. So uh, Cast has been under development for a while. Uh, our first release, like public release that we actually think is usable, uh, was about two weeks ago. Uh, it's focused on the single mach machine experience, which means we don't do much stuff with multi-machine uh, at all right now but it's focused on giving you a REST API to control your apps on top of that server. Uh, it's, you know, it's open source, and there's a big website and all that kind of stuff. So I wanted to give a little mini demo of CAST. So uh, I'm going to start the agent. Oops. OK, so it started an agent on my laptop. Um, and the command line client, just a simple command line client that wraps with things on the server. Um, so for example, uh, services list shows my running services. Uh, then I can go to that service and tail it. And if I can do things like curl that URL, uh, it, you know, the, the server uh, logs that request, you know, and you can see it over this command line client. So that's the simplest things, you know, getting started with CAST you can do. Um, it has a lot more to it. Uh, well, a lot more to it in the ways. So like how you make something a CAST project, it has a uh, thing called CAST.json, um, which defines, you know, general things about the server, defines uh, how you get into the service. Uh, this example is server.js, it's written in Node.js, but it could be any app, you know, you could have a Rails thing there or a Mongrel or whatever you wanted. It's not really Node.js specific, the actual thing you're deploying. Uh, it also has things like built-in uh, health checks. So we know that this service uh, should create an HTTP server on this port, and we expect a 200 from it. If we're not getting that, we consider the service is down and there's a problem. 
Okay. So there's a little bit of history to cast. Um, it's been kind of in development for about 10 months. Um, and you can see development has been up and down. There's some reason behind that. Um, the first thing that happened, uh, why development kind of paused, I would say, uh, is we got our startup got acquired by Rackspace. And so all of us were distracted with things like, you know, uh, lawyers making sure our source code didn't have the wrong IP in it and, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we got busy at the beginning of the year. And then what really changed our development, and well, we were ready to go back to on and work on it, but Node.js 04 came out, and it really enabled us and fixed a lot of the issues we saw in earlier versions of Node. And so we kind of have this 10-month history of pre-04, you know, we did a lot of prototyping, a lot of dev work, but after 04, we actually have something that we feel that's like usable by people. So I want to go through a lot of just our lessons learned with building Cast as a Node.js application, because um, I, I think that's where there's a lot of value for people. Uh, is, you know, we made a lot of mistakes because we started 10 months ago and there are lots of different things that you would do differently nowadays. Uh, the first one is just use NPM. Uh, when we started, there were like three other package managers and none of them were particularly good. Uh, and to say the truth, I don't think NPM was that good either at the point. Uh, but at this point, there's no reason not to use NPM. Um, today, things like the local module install, so you can bundle your entire app into one, you know, one set of node modules, is a huge improvement. It makes it very easy to move apps around servers. Uh, and the other thing we've used a lot uh, is internal NPM registries at CloudKick, uh, because we have some products that are not open source. But we have, so we want those modules to use the same pattern, though, so that if we ever do make them open source, it's very easy. It's flipping a switch. So one thing about using things from NPM, though, is that the community part of an a module is the most important thing. Um, careful of single author, you know, I'm learning Node.js modules, because uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, what you end up, you just have to know that if, you know, this guy goes away, you're going to own that module. And we've done that a couple times. Sometimes we submit patches, they just ignore them. Other times they're active and they take them back. But just be aware there's a lot of modules out there that don't have a lot of active maintainers. Uh, so a big thing we learned when we started doing Node is, uh, you know, we, we were originally in a twisted Python shop. And so we had a lot of unit tests already. We were you know, doing a lot of heavy unit testing. But it's very important with JavaScript um, that there is no compiler. So you really need test cases to show that you didn't break something. Um, we started using Espresso, uh, which is pretty common for most people. And we felt it was great for little web apps. But we felt uh, for our service, especially with Agent, it has a lot of state in it. Uh, it just wasn't uh, sustainable to keep using Espresso. So we wrote something called Whiskey. Uh, which is a you know, test runner, but it does a lot of things differently. Every test uh, file is ran in a subprocess, for example. So if you have a lot of like, global variable state or state changes inside your app, um, you can test that in Whiskey. And then you have a lot more isolation between processes, which was really important for us because a lot of our app is you know, downloading a file, uh, you know, spawning a subprocess to do tar, things like that, uh, which are not very easy to do uh, in Expresso. Um, so I want to show one thing from Espresso, which, yeah, internet's not there. Good. So uh, one of the things we built on top of Espresso is test coverage. Uh, sorry, built on top of Whiskey is test coverage. Um, so if you've seen like coverage.py for Python, it's a very similar uh, system. Um, you, you know, so you have the overall report of, you know, we only have 63% test coverage, which is pretty terrible, and we're working on fixing that. Um, but the cool thing is you can see exactly what lines were run as part of Whiskey. Um, so you can see, you know, it parsed this, f this file, so this, this line was ran, but the actual function was never called, so this line was never ran. Um, so it's, you know, very easy to see how to improve your test cases. So that gets to, like, Lint. Uh, you should also use JS Hint or JS Lint. Depends on if you believe Crockford is right all the time. Uh, it's kind of your choice. Um, there is no JS hint, which makes it very easy. It's just an NPM install. So, you know, use that. The one project we've been using a lot of, though, is Google Closure Linter, which is actually written in Python. Uh, but in, in it enforces code style according to Google's coding style guidelines, which if you don't like, well, you probably shouldn't use it. But we felt, we found that it was very helpful to just to have a, you know, coding standard. And we're just going to adhere to the Google coding standard and ClojureLint's uh, a very helpful tool for maintaining that. 
Now, one thing you hear a lot about on the front end side is people using the Clojure compiler uh, to you know, detect, uh, to do, compile their JavaScript into a single file, right, and compress it. But we're using it uh, as a linting step, as a static analysis tool. Um, so right now, it works great for single file statical analysis. Uh, but it doesn't understand yet like the node module structure or things like that. Uh, but we're, we're looking at how to do that so that you know, it understands uh, cross-module uh, errors. Uh, so here's an example of what it can do today very easily. You can detect things like inconsistent return types from the documented types, uh, you know, unused variables, uh, you know, a lot of kind of basic static analysis stuff that you just don't have normally in JavaScript. And so it's a very easy tool to kind of repurpose from the front end. Uh, Express, you should just use it. Uh, when we started, we thought, oh, HTTP is really easy. There's all these simple examples. We'll just, you know, write, use HTTP router and do our own thing. And that was like totally a mistake. Uh, you know, you should just use Express. There's no, like, it's so small in the scale of things. Uh, you know, you should just use it. It has a lot of utilities and it's going to keep getting better. Whereas if you just do your own thing, it's, you're always going to kind of be stuck in your world. Um, so a little story about TLS. Um, when we started, uh, it, it frankly didn't work. Well, we started using just HTTP, uh, which, you know, was easy, uh, but it, it just didn't, you know, and then we were like, oh, we'll just turn on SSL one day when we're ready, and we turned it on, and it completely bombed. Uh, just nothing would work at all. Uh, so that was zero two back in, like, September or October last year. And we're like, well, OK, so uh, I worked with Ryan a lot. And Ryan did a lot of the work, too, uh, to rewrite the whole SSL stack. Um, and you know, we did it. And uh, it mostly works in 0.4. And if you're, in, you're using since 0.6 uh, or so, it actually uh, generally works for everything. We haven't found many bugs since then. But if you do find a bug, please let us know. We'll fix it. Uh, streams. So. Especially pre-04, we had a lot of problems with streams. Uh, the API wasn't well defined. There's lots of other issues. Um, for example, we would untar a file or cat like or uh, sorry, uploading a file over HTTP, and we tried to stream.pipe it to the HTTP stream, and that would have like you know a 20% chance of working uh, successfully. Uh, but that's not the truth anymore. You, there's no reason to like reinvent your own stream API if you're like moving files around with HTTP. You should just use pipe. Um, there are some issues with error handling. There, it's not great. Um, but there's been a discussion, as we discussed uh, yesterday at Node Commit, was kind of trying to improve some of that stream error handling. Uh, I want to talk about flow control for a minute. Um, people come to Node, there's a lot of people talking about promises and other, you know, Node fibers and other solutions. Um, we've tried to stay away from them as much as possible. Um, you know, it's not, it's not JavaScript, it's not V8, it's not Node at that point. Um, we focus on using async, is the one we use a lot. Um, we found that very good for our use cases. Um, it provides, you know, 20 odd utility functions like parallel, serialize, map, um, that prevent, you know, the callback chaining uh, madness. Um, the other co very common popular one is called step. Um, you know, be so basically pick a way to do asynchronous things that's not just chaining callbacks. You know, pick a library that gives you a little bit of abstraction but I wouldn't recommend going off and using node fibers or investing really heavy in promises right now. Um, kind of one lesson through all this was um, just send patches. Um, you know, Ryan is very receptive to patches that fix things. Um, you know, when we started, you know, different people on our team have contributed quite a few patches at this point, and it's actually pretty easy. You know, make a test case that breaks, people, you know, then he'll accept your patch. Uh, fix the code and make a pull request. Um, and at this point, the most important thing for most people is it's mostly JavaScript. There's very few, well, there are bugs where you have to go to look into SeaWorld, but a lot of times there's pure JavaScript bugs that you don't have to look at. Uh, you know, you, you, you just, you're just patching a JavaScript thing, so it's much easier and more accessible to most people. So um, as part of Rackspace, we've kind of been leading the way inside Rackspace to trying to do more and more Node.js. Uh, we're building on our team in San Francisco just do, do, to do Node.js. Uh, we've open sourced a bunch of things. Uh, CAS is the main one. It's a ton of code. Uh, but we also open source things like our, our Node Cassandra client. And we're doing a bunch of things with our, uh, our uh, we have a serialization layer on top of Express that we're open sourcing as well. 
Um, so I would just say go check out the code. Um, and if there's any time uh, or any questions, I guess. Okay, so the question I think is just are we using CAS in production right now? Okay. Um, we are using it in kind of some staging environments and playing with it. It's not yet in production in a large scale. Um, our goal was really right now is to get zero one out, and then we just kind of finish that. And then our next goal, like for zero two, is to get uh, CloudKick production to use it as many places as we can. So that's kind of our next part of the project is we're going to use it in production and start that feedback loop of you know that's broken, D you know make the user interface better because um, you know like right now that for example the CAS client uh, corresponds very well with like the REST API, but like that's not what you want in a high level client. You want you know make this thing go. You know, you don't want it to match the REST API necessarily directly. Um, so that's kind of our next big part of the project is to productionize it and make it easier to use. The, the question is, uh, why didn't we use Express the first time? Um, and that was, you know, last year. It wasn't even clear necessarily that Express would, like, win. You know, like, it, 10 months ago, it was like there's a lot of those million modules and all of them are kind of crap. Um, and, and that's not the case anymore. Um, you know, and we, we said, oh, well, HTTP is really easy. We'll just make our own little router with a few regexes, you know, um, which you certainly can do. And it was fast, but, like, it, it's just not maintainable in the long run, right? And you, you lose out on all those middlewares that you just want to, you know, oh, look, someone made oh, a sorry. sweet, you know, rate limiting okay. middleware. So I want to go pull that in. Well, it's, you know, not quite that easy. Um, so you end up, you know, carrying a lot of the burden and maintaining your own thing. When Express just gives you a lot, it doesn't cost you very much. Like the cost of using Express is very low um, overall. And that's why I think people should just use it by default at this point. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.